Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is an absolute privilege for me to address the Nigerian International Petroleum Summit. OPEC has been extremely proud to support this summit since its first iteration in 2018. Unfortunately, the OPEC Secretariat team cannot attend in person due to the current travel restrictions, but we are in Abuja in heart and in spirit. Mr. President, in just over a month's time, we will commemorate a transformative date for OPEC and Nigeria, the 50th anniversary of Nigeria's membership of our organization. Over the last five decades, the unique relationship between OPEC and Nigeria has had a multitude of positive consequences for both parties. The intertwining destinies of OPEC and Nigeria predates membership. On 14 September 1960, OPEC was founded on the shores of the River Tigris in Baghdad, Iraq. Two weeks later, on 1st October 1960, Nigeria joined the Fraternity of Independent Nations. Many giants of Nigerian public service have been responsible for the successful membership and are addressing this summit today. It is an honor to share this platform with His Excellency President Muhammad Buhari. Mr. President, the OPEC family knows the depth of gratitude we owe you for the pivotal role you played in the declaration of cooperation process. The declaration of cooperation constitutes an unprecedented milestone in the history of OPEC. For this first time ever, OPEC coordinated with 10 non-OPEC oil producing countries, led by the Russian Federation, in a concerted effort to accelerate the stabilization of the global oil market. Mr. President, you have consistently shown your impeccable credentials as a bastion of the principles underpinning international relations, respect for all nations, fulfilling responsibilities, transparency, and fairness. Your tenure as president has coincided with two externally caused recessions. When you were first elected in 2015, Nigeria was in the midst of a recession caused by the plummeting oil prices. All energy dependent developing economies like ours were affected by this oil cycle downturn. From 2014 to 2016, world oil supply growth outpaced that of demand with world oil supply growing by 5.8 million barrels a day, while world oil demand increased by 4.3 million barrels a day. By July 2016, OECD commercial stock overhang reached a record high of about 403 million barrels over the five-year average. The OPEC reference basket price fell by an extraordinary 80% between June 2014 and January 2016. Some crude oil benchmarks fell below 10 US dollars a barrel. Mr. President, investments were also chalked off with exploration and production spending falling by an enormous 25% in both 2015 and 2016, a fall amounting to above 300 billion US dollars there were significant job losses across the industry, as well as increasing financial and operational stresses for many companies. In fact, a record number of companies in our industry filed for bankruptcy. In terms of foregone revenues to OPEC member countries, during this oil cycle, collectively, about one trillion US dollars was lost as a consequence of the plunge in prices in 2015 and 2016. No member country of OPEC was insulated from such a contraction in oil revenues during this market cycle. This had a severe impact on the resources available to the government to pursue its laudable development programs. Similarly, Mr. President, the 2021 recession was also caused by extraneous factors far beyond Nigeria's borders. The devastating spread of COVID-19 
severely impacted global oil demand, and again, developing economies were exposed. As the world economy contracted by 3.5% year on year in 2020, global oil demand declined by 9.5 million barrels a day. During the month of April 2020, oil demand dropped by a staggering 22 million barrels a day. And yet, Mr. President, and your government bravely rose to both of these great challenges, deploying exemplary managerial skills, acumen, and extraordinary prudence by diverting resources to the most productive sectors of the economy. The government was able to revive growth. Nigeria speedily exited recession and returned to the path of growth. The government organized virus containment measures, campaigns to sensitize the population to the devastating impacts of the pandemic, and promptly provided much-needed economic stimulus. This proactive response protected the economy from a more severe contraction. The government should be applauded for its quick and robust actions. When President Muhammad Buhari assumed office, he swore an oath to discharge his duties in the interest of Nigeria's sovereignty, integrity, and solidarity. The president has the sacred duty and responsibility to act in the interest of the unity and security of our nation and peoples. I commend the president for being faithful to his oath of office, especially in the face of glaring threats to our security. Violent attacks on our men and women in uniform are reprehensible and should be condemned by all and sundry in the strongest terms possible. I urge all my fellow compatriots to join hands to support all levels of government to promote the cause of unity, peace, and stability of our great country, Nigeria. Mr. President, there simply has never been anything like the COVID-19 pandemic in modern memory. Daily life has been transformed by the necessary lockdowns initiated by governments across the world, as well as the widespread travel restrictions and the business and industry shutdowns. No nation or sector of the global economy has been spared. By the end of March 2020, the world seemed a different planet to what it had been at the beginning of that month. First and foremost, the COVID-19 pandemic is a human tragedy. Almost 180 million people have been sickened by the virus. Over 3.7 million precious lives have perished, and millions of livelihoods have been destroyed. No region or sector has been spared. As the International Labour Organization has shown, labour markets around the world were disrupted in 2020 on a historically unprecedented scale. According to the ILO, estimates 8.8% of global working hours were lost relative to the fourth quarter of 2019, equivalent to a staggering 255 million full-time jobs. Ominously, working hour losses in 2020 were approximately four times greater than during the global financial crisis in 2009. The most challenging period in this most challenging of years was April 2020. Mr. President, in OPEC, we were stunned by things happening that we never imagined possible. On 20th of April 2020, the West Texas Intermediate crude went negative for the first time in history, with prices plummeting to minus $37 a barrel. Sellers, Mr. President, were paying buyers to lift their crude on that fateful day. In response to this unprecedented situation, OPEC knew it had to act. Thankfully, we did not need to reinvent the wheel. We turned to the mechanism, the framework, that had helped us emerge out of the 2015-2016 oil market downturn, the declaration of cooperation between OPEC and non-OPEC producing countries. It was an effort to move from crisis to opportunity. 
participating countries have taken proactive and preemptive action to help reduce volatility, stabilize the oil market, and provide a flexible platform for recovery with potentially broader participation in the coming years. This was evidently on display, Mr. President, at the 9th and 10th extraordinary meetings of the OPEC and non-OPEC ministerial meetings on the 9th and 12th of April 2020, respectively. At these seminal meetings, it was agreed to adjust downwards overall crude oil production by 9.7 million barrels a day starting in May and June 2020. From 1st of July 2020 to 31st December 2020 by 7.7 .7 million barrels a day. And from 1st of January 2021 to 30th of April 2022 by another 5.8 million barrels a day. This is the largest ever production adjustments by the Declaration of Cooperation participants, the largest in the history of OPEC, and the largest in the history of the oil industry. These industry saving measures were commended by a broad range of stakeholders, including the G20 under the presidency of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Participating countries have subsequently reviewed these decisions on a monthly basis to proactively anticipate market developments and improve the core principles upon which our enterprise was founded, namely transparency, equity, and fairness. High conformity levels with these production adjustments have been testimony to the depth of our commitment. In total, Mr. President, we held the ministerial meetings nine times in 2020 and so far five times in 2021. After the unprecedented turmoil of last year, in recent months we have seen relative stability in the oil market. The market has continued to react positively to the decisions we took, including the upward adjustments of production levels beginning in May this year. Overall conformity to the production adjustments was 114 percent in April 2021, reinforcing the trend of high conformity by the participating countries. Mr. President, the global economy, oil market fundamentals, and the oil demand outlook have all been encouraged by positive news of vaccine rollouts and the continuing massive fiscal stimulus that is driving the economic rebound. OPEC has revised its economic global outlook forecast up to 5.5% for 2021, and the oil demand growth forecast remains at 6 million barrels a day. It should be borne in mind that the majority of this demand is backloaded to the second half of 2021. A backwardation Additionally, we saw a drawdown of 6 0.9 million barrels month on month in OECD commercial oil stock inventories in April. This is 160 million barrels lower than the same time one year ago, and 34 million barrels above the 2015-2019 uh, average. We expect to see further drawdowns in the months ahead. Despite the positives, Mr. President, it is clear that uncertainties remain such as the continuing high number of COVID-19 cases in some parts of the world, the uneven vaccine rollout, particularly when looking at the developed versus the developing world, virus mutations, an orderly and transparent return of supplies to the global market, inflationary pressures, and central bank responses. Mr. President, over the last 20 months, OPEC has upgraded its volatility fighting toolkit. Our monthly meetings and partnership with non-OPEC producing countries under the Declaration of Cooperation have enabled us to improve both the nimbleness and comprehensiveness of our responses to oil market stability. Allow me to conclude by assuring Mr. President and all stakeholders in the energy industry that we are determined to build on the progress achieved thus far 
and do what we can to continue to contribute to stability in the oil market on a sustainable basis in the interest of all producers, all consumers, and the global economy. Mr. President, on behalf of good health, many years of service to our great country, to OPEC and the international community. I thank you for your kind attention and I wish us all a very successful summit. Thank you very much, His Excellency Mohamed Sanusi Bakindo, Secretary General of OPEC. There, onwards, onwards.